God is faithful. It is well with my soul. We should never get our eyes on circumstances because circumstances will make us depressed. Circumstances will stress us out, but God has given us a stress remover. Note that I said stress remover, not stress reliever. I don't want to be relieved of stress. I don't want it at all. <laughs> he has given us his promises, which demonstrates his plan or reveal his plan for our life. And as a believer, we should learn the promises of God so that we can have peace in our souls and sleep like a baby. The word of God is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing of the sun, of the soul, and the spirit, and the joints of the marrow, and is a credit of thoughts and intents of the heart. All strips is God's breath and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped and furnished for every good work. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. If you will, open the word of truth to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 3. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 3. We are continuing our study of 1 Timothy, and we see Paul's instruction to this young pastor by the name of Timothy, showing him how to practice godliness in interpersonal relationships. He had just showed Timothy that he, are, he is to see every believer in the church as a member of his own family. And we have been looking at this concept of how we are to apply what we know about our relationship with every believer. Last week, I titled last week message, Know and Practice. And we saw that Knowing the Bible is not the goal of the Christian life. Applying the word of God to life is the goal so that our lives may change. Conformity to the image of Christ is the goal of the Christian life. Each and every day, your life should become different than what it was in the past when you were an unbeliever. And as it relates to your relationship with other believers, the word of God is full of commands related to your relationship with one another and my relationship with other believers. And we are to take those principles and apply in our dealing with one another so that we may treat each other as royal family. And now he want to show Timothy how to practice godliness and his duty to widows. So today we will be talking about uh, 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 the pastor's duty to the widows. So we'll be looking at verse uh, 3 through 16. So Paul now gives instruction concerning the church responsibility for the widows in order to make clear who the church should provide for. To make clear who the church should provide for or support on a regular basis financially. So in verse three, honor widows who are widows indeed. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, they must first learn to practice piety in regard to their own family and to make some return to their parents. For this is acceptable in the sight of God. Now she who is a widow indeed and who has been left alone has fixed her hope on God and continues in entreaties and prayers night and day. But she who give herself to one pleasures is dead even while she lives. Prescribe these things as well so that they may be above reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worth than an unbeliever. A widow is to be put on the list only if she is not less than 60 years old, having been the wife of one man 
having a reputation for good works, if she has brought up children, if she has shown hospitality to strangers, if she has watched the saints speak, if she has assisted those in distress, and if she has devoted herself to every good work, but refused to put younger widows on the list, for when they feel sexual desire to disregard Christ, they want to get married, thus incurring condemnation because they have set aside their previous pledge. At the same time, they also learn to be idle as they go around from house to house and not merely idle, but also gossip and busybodies, talking about things not proper to mention. Therefore, I want younger widows to get married bear children, keep house, and give the enemy no occasion for reproach. For some have already turned aside to follow Satan. If any woman who is a believer has dependent widows, she must assist them, and the church must not be burdened so that it may assist those who are widows indeed. A widow is a woman whose husband has died. The basic thought here is that of loneliness due to losing her husband. Widows were considered vulnerable individual as well as orphans. So orphans and widows were considered to be vulnerable. And care and protection of widows was recognized as an ethical obligation in Judaism and the same view had been adopted by the church from the beginning. God has always given special concern and protection for widows and orphans. In Deuteronomy 10, verse 18, the scripture reads, He executed justice for the orphans and the widow and showed his love for the alien by giving him food and clothing. Deuteronomy 23, 17, you should not pervert justice due to an alien or an orphan, nor take a widow's garment in pledge. The church attitude toward widows and orphan is to be mirrored after this principle of the Old Testament. In other words, God care and protect widows and orphans. And the church is to mirror after God's attitude and God's heart. And the early Christian church did just that. They mirrored God's attitude toward widows and orphans. If you recall in Acts chapter 6 verse 1, that's how we got the, the office of deacons. Because in Acts 6 1, some of the local Jewish Hebrews were neglecting providing for the widows in Acts 6 1, and the apostle uh, 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 um, uh, brought about the office of deacon to meet the needs of the widows. So, in those times, a woman's social status, a lot of times, uh, 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 came from her father or her husband. And now that her husband is, is gone, they need to be provided for. They're lonely now. In verse 3, where uh, the church is told and Timothy is told to honor widows, uh, uh, give them respect, support them. The church is to respect and give support to those who are widows indeed. Now notice Paul say those who are widows indeed. So in other words, there are three kinds of widows in the church. There are three kinds of widows in this church. One, those who had children and grandchildren who could financially support them. The church were not to be burdened with the, have the financial burden of widows who had children and grandchildren that can support them. In verse four, we see that. That true, the widow's children and grandchildren are commanded to learn to practice piety or fulfill their religious obligation. How? They are to give back to their parents for their years of sacrifice. So grandchildren and children were to give back to their parents for the years of sacrifices 
of meeting their needs. Another type of widow in, in this chapter uh, is uh, uh, a widow who had no family at all to care for them. The church should, the church should care for the second group. The widows with no family to care for them. Widows with non-supportive family member, no opportunity for marriage, uh, and have been and and have given themselves to the Lord. And we see that uh, in, uh, in verse six, uh, verse uh, verse um, verse. Um, uh, where is the verse? I, I missed missed the verse. But in verse the last part of verse. Uh, Five, the widow is saying, now she who is a widow indeed, who has been left alone, has fixed her hope on God and continues in entreaties and prayers night and day. So the widow indeed, or the person who have no family member to support them, they look to God each and every day to provide for their need. And, and so it is this widow that is to get the church financial help only those widows without children or supporting relatives but some people in the church probably were looking down on widows uh, uh, because of what they did not have instead of looking at their who they are rather than what they have is that person have a lifestyle of commitment to God? Then the church is to support that widow. The older widow looks to God, expecting him to provide for her, demonstrating through her continued prayers and petition here. In verse 6, we have a, a, a another uh, type of, of widow. Verse 6, the phrase here, the person who give herself to one in pleasure. This one in pleasure means someone who live uh, have a luxury way of life. So the third type of widow are those who give themselves to the pursuit of pleasure rather than their pursuit of God. Their widow, I mean, they're, uh, they lost their husband, but they have given themselves to the pursuit of pleasure rather than the pursuit of God. See, they do not qualify for regular support uh, uh, from the, the church. You know, in those times, many widows were tempted to resort to immoral living as a means to support themselves. And that is probably what Paul means right here about these who live in pleasure. Uh, and, and the wages of, uh, of these women who are living a luxurious life of pleasure. In verse 6, it says, she is dead even while she lives. She is spiritually dead even while she is physically alive. So the widow who is living for pleasure rather than living for God or her pursuit of pleasure take precedence over her pursuit of God. The Bible say here that she is spiritually dead. Go to James 2, verse 17. She is spiritually dead because she's misusing her riches and misusing her time. I'm sorry, James 5, verse 5. James 5, verse 5. In James 5, verse 5, James speaks of those who misuse their riches And amongst those who misuse their riches in luxury living, pursuing pleasure rather than pursuing their relationship with God, is not to be supported by the church, though that person may be a, a widow or ha may have lost their husband. Verse 5, you have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. So the same Greek word here. James used the same Greek word that Timothy used, and the word and the word wanting pleasure is simply mean to live luxuriously, uh, live in luxury. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. So here, 
we see a uh, a, a believer uh, who is a widow who is misusing their riches to pursuing pleasure rather than pursuing God. And see the difference between uh, 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 believers and unbelievers is our appetite. So is he satisfied with the things of God or does he go after the things of the world? So in James, this person of woman and uh, pleasure, instead of being satisfied in their relationship with God, they're more satisfied with the pursuits of this world and the pleasure of this world rather than with God. And so a widow woman, mostly young widow women, is tempted to pursue pleasure above pursuing God. Going back to verse 7 of 1 Timothy uh, 5, Paul commands Timothy, prescribe these things as well so that they may be above reproach. So here Paul commands Timothy to give the instruction. Why? So that the family members in the church would sh uh, shoulder their rightful responsibility to, to incur the widow to seek the Lord and be above reproach rather than pursuing lives characterized by indulging in luxury pleasures. So he said, instruct these things as well so that they may be above reproach. So in other words, instead of pursuing the pleasures of this world, your pursuit of God should be number one priority. Instruct them to put their pursuit of God as the number one priority because that is going to lead to them living a life beyond reproach. In verse 8, here Paul cited a common recognized responsibility in order to encourage the kin folks of this widow to provide for them. Verse 8, but if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and worth than an unbeliever. See, unbelievers fulfill their duty to their family members. Every unbeliever acknowledges that you should provide for your family. That is a universal thing that everybody understands. If a Christian fail to provide for his family and he is living contrary to his faith and he's worse than a typical unbeliever who helps, his needed kin folks. Our Lord Jesus, when he hung on the cross, even on the cross, he made sure that his mother was provided for. Him. He told John, Behold your mother. He wanted to make sure that his mother was cared for. Him. And so Jesus called us all to provide for those of our own who are widows or indeed. He called his disciples to be willing to give up the pleasure of family in order to follow him, but he didn't tell you to give up your responsibility to your family to provide for the needy widow. So the care of the family is one of our ministries as ministers. Verse 9 and 10, here is who should receive regular support. Here's the criterion. A widow is to be put on the list if what? She got to be 60 years old. She got to be 60 years old. Two, she had to have been a wife of one man. In other words, she wasn't, she couldn't be a woman uh, who is um, messing around with, you know, uh, uh, flirting around with different men. Three, she had to have established a reputation for doing good works. And the example of doing good work means she had brought up children responsibly. She had humbly served Christians. She has helped people who were in distress and in need. She had devoted herself to good work and expression of her faith in God. That is the criteria. And then verse 11 and 12, 
it was not wise to place younger women on the list. And then Paul going to explain why. Why shouldn't you put? Why shouldn't Timothy put young women on the list of the widows that the church support? What did he say? Verse eleven. He said, "But refuse to put younger on the list, for they feel sensual desire in regard to Christ, in disregard for Christ. They want to get married." So, in other words, it was it, the younger widow physical desires would be stronger. And these feelings would make it very hard for them to remain committed to serving Christ wholeheartedly as a single woman. So the metaphor is that of a young animal trying to free itself from the yoke and become resistive through its fulfillment. So if an animal is trying to, you know, uh, get loose, Steve Poppy, from a yoke, and that he he, he give this. Uh, picture of a, of a young woman a young woman just filled with desires and, 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 and so Paul said it's very difficult for a young single woman to remain wholeheartedly committed to the Lord so don't put them on the list if the church leader placed young widows on the list and they wanted to remarry they would have to set aside their previous pledge of devotion to the Lord and the service to the Lord they were encouraged some temporary condemnation. Their conscience would be condemning them that they're no longer able to be committed. So don't put them on the list because their devotion to Christ is going to be divided now because they are married. In verse 13 through 15, as we just read, Placement on the list of supported widows would not be good for young widows because it would open them up to the temptation of idleness and inconsistent behavior. They would naturally be tempted to use their energy and time too much talking and becoming gossips, get into other people's affairs and become busybodies. And that will bring reproach on the Lord and their commitment. So in short, they will fail to participate in the activities of the church and become involved in what was destructive. Contrast to the behavior of the older widows. The older widows tend to be more committed, more dedicated. Younger wid widows got many, many desires and they're less dedicated. So in view of the possibility of younger widows intruded into other people's affairs inappropriately, Paul encouraged young widows to do what? Let them marry. Verse 14. Therefore, I want young widows to get married. You won't be in everybody's business. Bear children, keep house, and give the enemy no occasion for reproach. Now right here, uh, he tells them, get married, bear children, Keep house and keep house here, uh, since we know that that ultimately the responsibility to God for what happened in the home is on the husband. But Paul is saying here that the younger widow, under the leadership of their husband, is to manage their household under the leadership of their husband, because of what other parts of Scripture say about the man's leadership. By remarrying, the younger widow could not give the enemy an opportunity to criticize them from going back on their pledge to Christ. So this must have already started going on in the church for Paul to have to encourage Timothy uh, to don't put them on the list, encourage them to marry, because evidently they had already been doing it in the Ephesian church. And in, in forsaking their uh, serving to Christ, some had turned to follow Satan. And then in conclusion, verse 16. If any man who is a believer had dependent widows, she must assist them, and the church must not be burdened. Shame on believers to burden the church with supporting widows indeed when they have children and grandchildren that is supposed to pay them back for their years of sacrifice. So in conclusion, Paul sought to correct misunderstanding 
He wanted the financially capable women. I mean, the, the financial capital, capable believer to support their women widows. And he wanted the younger widows to marry so that they would not bring reproach on Christ. When we come back, we will look at the duties of the pastor to the elders and the other leaders in the church. All right, we'll stop right here. Let us pray. Father, we're so grateful for your word on how to live a godly life and how to honor you. We ask that you will give us hearts that desires to obey you and line our thought and our practice with our life. We ask that you would keep our minds and hearts until we meet again in Christ's name. Amen. All right, y'all have a good, good day. God bless you.